The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I'm sure for the hydrogen and biofuels folks, it might be a little hard, which is why that's what I'm going to cover today. So we all have sort of the same amount of, uh, of a head start to help go through this stuff. Does anyone have any questions on the design or what the groups are responsible for before I actually get into today's lectures? OK, great. Um, so I wanted to go through three things today. Um, through hydrogen production, biofuel production, and the design process and importance metrics because you guys are going to be coming up with a lot of design possibilities. And in the end, you're going to have to pick one. And I'll go over a couple of strategies where you can formally put down what sort of things are important, what aren't important, and actually have a numerical methodology to pick what's most important for you. So when somebody comes back and says, oh, why did you pick this part of the design? You can't just say, because it's the best or because I rolled the dice. You can say, well, we actually assigned importances to different aspects. And here's our chart. If you have some problems, let's revise the chart. And so this will help if you decide to switch design parameters later. You'll already have a methodology where you can just change relative importances on things, come up with the, with the, uh, the new optimal design pretty quickly. So first I'll get into a survey of hydrogen production methods. Um, some of the major considerations to think about are what temperatures do you need to produce hydrogen? And that helps determine what heat source to use, which helps feed back and tell the core people, I need to uh, outlet temperature of roughly this. So you may have noticed by now that uh, sort of the, the, the flow of design parameters isn't moving from the core outwards to the hydrogen and biofuels folks. It's moving from hydrogen and biofuels back in. Um, the core has a lot of different options. You might not have as many viable options for hydrogen and biofuels production. And so when you're more restricted on one end than the other, that'll tend to say those folks with more restrictions might have a bigger say in the overall design parameters. Um, you'll want to consider your overall cost per GGE or gallon of gas equivalent. So how much does a certain amount of energy in hydrogen cost versus the same amount in gasoline? That'll be a really good way for you to tell people quickly, hydrogen is this much more expensive than gasoline for energy equivalent. And then you can rationalize why it's a little more expensive, or if it's less expensive, that's a selling point for your technology. Are there any emissions to the process? Uh, what new technologies can improve things? So in the, in the core and process heat folks, as well as these lectures, I've been going over some of the more tried and true methods for core design, for process heat, transport, storage. Um, don't let that limit you. Um, I think, Matt, you were talking about the uh, inductor storage, right? Yeah, Matt came upon a, uh, a strategy where you end up passing a large electric current through some inductors, and when the load disappears, you close the loop, and the inductor keeps the current flowing. So while those ideas might seem a little wacky, they might not be. They might end up being the best strategy when you balance off how far it's been developed versus what it can get you. So. Don't let what I describe here limit your choices and your research. Uh, and one of the things I want the hydrogen folks to think about is how much do you actually want to make? And if that's a small amount, do you even care about the cost of production? Because if you're only making a small amount, you can use an expensive process. And the overall cost of the hydrogen production versus the overall plant could be negligible, in which case that could open up more options for you guys to consider. So the first process I'll talk about, which I don't recommend using, would be the Kfarner process, which is pretty simple. You take a fuel, you zap it with a plasma arc at about 1,600 Celsius, and out comes carbon and hydrogen. Uh, some problems with this is it burns fuel. It requires 1,600 C temperatures, which I don't think any of our designs can even come close. And there are also other processes that gasify fuels. I wouldn't take all those off the market yet, but uh, this is an example of one that's used, but I wouldn't consider for you guys. 
One solution that's been tried and true for over 100 years is low temperature electrolysis. This is also pretty simple. It works as low as room temperature. All you do is you take some water and maybe a soluble salt to improve the conductivity. Hook up a battery or another electromotive source to some electrodes. Oxygen comes out on one electrode and hydrogen comes out on the other. Now there are some problems with this. It requires electricity. And if you guys are in the process of making heat, you have to go from heat, convert to electricity, where you lose about two thirds of your energy, then convert to hydrogen. So it's a fairly inefficient process, and it's expensive. Um, you need to use things like platinum electrodes, and there's a fairly high cell voltage to overcome. Well, that may not look like a high voltage compared to the wall. In electrochemical terms, it's pretty big. Uh, now, again, you don't have to exclude this. If you only want to make a small amount of hydrogen for whatever reason you choose, you might go with this. There are actually you know, consumer devices, hydrogen electrolysis machines that you plug into the wall, and hydrogen comes out. We, in fact, use one in our lab, although it only makes about 20 cubic centimeters per minute. So you probably need a little more than that. So what can we do to improve the situation? We can increase the temperature drastically. Um, this plot over here shows the free energy of the electrolysis of water of basically a breaking apart water versus temperature. And you can see it goes down pretty steep with temperature. If you look at the equilibrium constant, the dissociation constant, it's going up by a few, you know, 10 or 20 orders of magnitude every 100 or 200 C. Uh, what happens when this K equals 1? What's going to start happening? Do you guys remember this at all from uh, who took 3091? No one took 3091. Wow. OK. Once, once you have a reaction constant of 1, <laughs> products in the reactants are going to be in equal concentrations, roughly. Um, so you know, if, we have, if we extrapolate out to where k equals 1, the temperature is like off the chart. So that's no good for us. But we can make it easier. And so by supplying a lot of the energy in the form of heat, you can lower the amount of electric input that you need to electrolyze water. Um, there are three common cycles used that use high temperature. We're talking you know, 8 to 850 Celsius heat. That's not a hard requirement. That's just the number at which folks have agreed it's efficient enough to pursue. It works at lower temperatures, not, not that much lower, maybe a couple hundred degrees. But the efficiency is really low. Um, so the names of these cycles, which I'm sure you'll see in the papers a lot, are the ISPRA Mark 13 cycle, the hybrid sulfur cycle, which is also known as the Westinghouse sulfur process, and GA22, and ISPRA Mark 11. They're all the same thing, as well as the sulfur iodine process. And I'll just explain these processes really quickly to you guys. So the theory behind these all is very similar. You raise the temperature. You lower the activation energy to break apart that water molecule. In addition, you add sulfuric acid you lower the cell voltage. So you lower the electrochemical force you need to break apart water. All these three processes use the same first step, where you start off with sulfuric acid in water and sulfur, sulfur trioxide, which is in equilibrium with H2SO4. And you break it apart into SO2, H2O, and O2. And I'll get back to uh, this in a second. I'll mention that maybe five minutes. Step two for the sulfur iodine and ISPRA 13 processes, which are very, very similar, is then you take iodine for the sulfur iodine process, or bromine for the ISPRA 13 process. Either way, it's a halogen. Add it, and you end up with hydroiodic acid or hydrobromic acid. Chemically, they're very, very similar, and sulfuric acid. Step three is you break these apart in a lower temperature reaction, like 400 or 450 C into hydrogen, and you get out your halogen again. Step two for the Westinghouse sulfur process, which is the only other step besides step one, it's direct electrolysis from sulfur dioxide and water directly back to H2SO4 and hydrogen. But all of these require input heat at 850C or so in order to, for most people to consider them efficient. And that's not, that doesn't leave the core a lot of options. Um, just to go through a diagram of the sulfur iodide process. There's sort of a high temperature step where you end up splitting sulfuric acid. And there's a low temperature step where you end up splitting up your halogen acid into actual hydrogen. 
Um, there is a little bit of heat rejection. It needs a fair bit of water. And oxygen is removed. Uh, and you can actually remove more of it, which I'll get into in a second. The other two processes have the same high temperature reactions. And they just have slightly different low temperature reactions. Now, these aren't really the limiting factors here. Um, notice on this diagram, well, first of all, notice this source. This would be a good one to look up and go from there. On this diagram, it's indicated that with an inorganic membrane, the process heat input is lower to 700 C. Um, has anyone ever heard of this process of molecular sieving, where you filter, literally filter out the smaller molecules? No? OK, well, I'll go into that right now. One of the ways that you can lower the temperature requirement for these hydrogen reactions is to remove the products from the reaction. This reaction is going to have some sort of equilibrium constant. And if you remove products from one side, you shift the reaction in the direction of the removed products. One way to rem two ways to remove the products are to have a membrane with different sized holes. So this is taken from a, a similar but different application, trying to separate hydrogen from nitrogen. The nitrogen molecules are these big green ones, and the hydrogen ones are the small blue ones. Um, if you have a hole in the membrane big enough for them all to pass through pretty easily, you don't end up separating them. They all get through, and it's just a leaky membrane. If you have a membrane that's just slightly too big to stop the nitrogen molecules from going through, you enter a regime what's known as Knudsen diffusion. Um, again, going back to this 3091 knowledge, if you have a bunch of different molecules at the same temperature, they have different kinetic energies where the lighter molecules will have a higher kinetic energy than the, lower, than, the, uh, sorry, than the heavier ones from Ke equals half mv squared. Something has a higher kinetic energy. It has a higher velocity, which means it's bouncing up and back against this membrane more frequently. So more of the smaller molecules will make an attempt at getting through this hole than the larger ones. You can also have what's called a molecular sieve, which is where you have holes that are literally too small for the bigger molecules to get through. So all that comes out here is hydrogen, leaving the nitrogen behind. But there are drawbacks to that. The total mass throughput here could be lower. Um, so you have to think about how, how much do you want to purify the hydrogen in this step in terms of removing, or, you know, not the, sorry, not the hydrogen, the products in this step. How much do you want to remove the products you know, in terms of purity versus mass flow? That's the big trade-off here. There are plenty of new methods for producing hydrogen. One of them is to use microbes. Some bacteria actually produce hydrogen when they're deprived of sulfur. So there are a lot of bacteria that normally rely on a sulfur digestion cycle. When you remove them, they start metabolizing other things, and one of the byproducts is hydrogen. So another way you may consider making hydrogen in small to medium amounts is biologically with bacteria. Does not require much process heat that could simplify the process heat people's world by removing heat transport to the hydrogen plant. All you really need is enough electricity to power the building and whatever ancillary stuff you need to keep the bacteria alive. And there are lots of bacteria, like E. coli and all these other ones, that can produce hydrogen from organic materials. There's also a new process coming out, uh, low temperature urine electrolysis. Believe it or not, uh, urea contains four very weakly bound hydrogen atoms compared to water. And it has a much lower cell voltage than water. So it's about three, it's a little more than three times as efficient, according to some preliminary research, to electrolyze <coughs> urine than water. And urine is one of the largest waste streams on the planet. So if you want to consider collecting, transporting, and using this valuable resource, you might just make your lives easier. Not to mention that with a lower cell voltage, you don't need uh, these expensive platinum catalysts. It can use nickel. So that takes a lot of the cost out of these electrolysis cells. And there are plenty more that exist. I don't want to go through them all because I need to get through two other lectures in this hour. So on to biofuels. More than bovine emissions. But it actually has some of the methods do have a lot in quality with bovine emissions, as you'll see in a second. The basic theory is to produce hydrocarbons from carbon and hydrogen-bearing chemicals. These hydrocarbons are used as fuel. So you sort of 
burn in reverse. Even, even the word burn is a misnomer. You run this combustion reaction in reverse. It consumes fairly large amounts of energy in terms of process heat and electricity, but some major advantages are it sequesters carbon. One of its inputs is carbon monoxide, which can indirectly come carbon dioxide or from biological feedstock that use carbon dioxide as one of their inputs. It can use waste from crop production, so you can turn something that has been useless into something that is useful. And really, the reason I included it on this project is it displaces fossil fuels. So there's a lot of hype over domestic energy independence. And producing these biofuels in this country is one of the best ways of doing that. So one that you've probably seen if you own a car is producing ethanol from cellulose. If you look at a lot of gas pumps today, that they might not be this obvious, but there'll be a sticker on it that says contains less than 10% ethanol, which means it contains some ethanol. A lot of that ethanol comes from corn. Uh, corn produces a lot of sugar. That sugar can be fermented into ethanol. That ethanol can be burned into your car. Uh, it's made from enzymatic decomposition of lignocellulose. To go over those terms, lignin is sort of the woody part of the plant, and then the cellulose are the poly sugars. Um, so this process is surprisingly similar to bovine emissions. What you essentially do is get a giant mechanical cow of sorts, ferment these products, and siphon off the ethanol. And it does produce biogas, just like natural reactors, cows. Um, there is a concern about producing toxins. These lignin, uh, this lignus, lignin fraction produces a lot of funny aromatic compounds that are considered toxic. There is this concern, however valid, about we're burning our food. You know, we're growing corn, and then we're burning it in our cars when there's all these hungry people out there. But I'll leave the validity of that concern up to you guys. Um, and this lignin fraction is often burned. It's very hard to convert this into something that's useful, so you burn it to produce energy to power the cellulose decomposition reactions. So enter nuclear heat. If we don't want to burn our food in our cars, using a high temperature process heat opens up a lot of doors. You can produce something called syngas, synthetic gas. It's essentially a mixture of carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and other hydrocarbons that with sufficiently high temperature you can produce from a lot of these biofuels. You can then further refine it if you don't want a gaseous end product in what's called fischer tropsch synthesis where you take those gases and you combine them and you end up forming liquid fuels. And one of the nice things about these liquid fuels is if you start with really pure syngas, you end up with really pure fuel. So this here is a beaker of commercial diesel fuel. Over here is a beaker of fischer tropsch synthetic diesel fuel. A lot of the yellow stuff can come from sulfur compounds, which is one of the main really bad emissions coming out of oil fields. Especially when, you, when uh, we're running out of oil, we have to go to lower quality sources, which are higher in sulfur. If you can find a way to produce this same fuel without locking in all the sulfur, which ends up going out of your cars, that's a real big plus. So for syngas, what you do is partially combust whatever feedstock you want, whether it's corn silage or switchgrass or sugar cane or whatever you want with oxygen to create carbon monoxide, and hydrogen. Now this gas mixture can actually be burned as a fuel. It's often burned in biofuel plants to fuel further reactions that require a high temperature. Um, feedstocks can be plants or they can actually be coal. Has anyone heard of coal liquefaction or coal gas liquefaction? This is pretty much what happens. Um, traditional coal to liquid technologies get about one third of the carbon from the coal into the fuel, the rest emitted. But uh, with enough hydrogen from the nuclear plant, you can actually capture almost all of the carbon from coal. So rather than losing two thirds of the energy, or not the energy, but the carbon from the coal, you can actually use it and need to get less of it in the end. So whatever stocks of coal we have can last longer. Um, as I said, syngas can be burned as fuel or fed as feedstock into fischer tropsch synthesis reactions. Now for fischer tropsch fuel synthesis, you start off with a mixture, ideally, of pure hydrogen and carbon monoxide, and you end up making 
nice hydrocarbons, these carbon-hydrogen chains with the carbon backbone and the hydrogen surrounding it, better known as fuel, and water is the other main byproduct. If you look at the exponents in this reaction, you need about twice as much hydrogen as you do carbon monoxide. But a lot of these feedstocks, when you burn them, they actually make less hydrogen than they do carbon monoxide. So you can see that you need a ratio of about two hydrogen to carbon monoxide, and you end up with about 0.7 from raw feedstock alone. So this here is one of the best places where the hydrogen folks can make an impact. If the biofuel folks say, we intend to make this much fuel, which means that we're going to have this much missing hydrogen. There's your minimum hydrogen production number. Now you can choose to make more hydrogen if you want to sell it as fuel cells, but you don't necessarily have to. It's up to you guys to determine what this country can use in terms of fuels. Do you see synthetic biofuels being a bigger impact? Do you see a hydrogen economy or fuel cells being a bigger impact? That choice is up to you. These require fairly low temperatures. So temperatures of 150 to 300 Celsius. So if you guys can find ways of bypassing the syngas step or otherwise producing hydrogen and carbon monoxide using a lower temperature process, you may not have that high temperature requirement to produce your end products. Um, I already mentioned that. I already mentioned that. Good. So an example of one of these combined fin syngas fischer trope cycles. Um, if you want to see lots more, I starred this for a reason, check this source out. This paper, and actually this whole series of papers, has a lot from introductory to technical detail on different ways, methods, and combinations of making biofuels. And they actually go into economics and cost too, which I'm not going to expect you guys to say, give me a dollar amount to the nearest dollar. but I will expect you to say, we chose this because it's cheaper and we don't have an engineering trade-off or something like that. Um, in this, you end up with biomass and ammonia, uh, whatever source of biomass you want. And this here is essentially our giant mechanical synthetic cow that produces ethanol and biogas as well as solid residue. This solid residue is still rich in carbon. So you can gasify it, like I said, by partially combusting with oxygen. Remove the impurities that you don't want, like hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide. And at this point, it's clean syngas, which you can then feed into fischer tropsch synthesis, refine it just as you would in an oil refinery, out come fischer tropsch liquids. Whatever syngas you don't use, you could burn as fuel and produce electricity, or you can burn it and use that heat to fuel maybe the gasification reaction. So maybe your process heat doesn't have to come from the nuclear plant in its entirety. Maybe it can come from burning syngas. Uh, or you can split it and do both. And there are lots of other configurations. But uh, the end product of what I'd like the biofuels folks to give, and I'm not, I don't mean after week four, I mean after week eight, is a diagram like this, where you know what your inputs and outputs are how much they are, and really why you chose each one. So you can say, we chose this set of inputs and outputs because that. And as you're choosing things, think about what bi whatever biomass you choose is going to decide, pretty much determine the rough region of the country where you're going to site this whole installation. Because you can put a nuclear plant in a lot of different places in this country. You can make hydrogen pretty much anywhere. But you can't grow certain crops in certain places. You know, you can grow potatoes in sandy soil. You can grow corn in uh, the soil all over the Midwest. You know, you can't really grow anything in the Badlands. You can grow lots of stuff near volcanic soil. So that will your your choice of what feedstock to use will pretty much determine in what rough region of the country this plant will be sited. And I don't really need you guys to tell me exactly what site it's going to be until the very end of the course. So just keep it in mind. But it's not a big factor right now. So there are plenty of other methods being proposed or demonstrated on a research or R&D or prototype or commercial scale for making biofuels. One of them that there's a lot of ARPA-E energy grants out for is electrofuels. It uses syngas as a feedstock. Uh, and microbes act as catalysts 
uh, sorry, that should be a T. Uh, micro acts as catalyst in fuel cells. So you end up with microbes consuming syngas, lowering the, uh, and then outputting things that lower the activation barrier to, uh, oh, sorry, to, uh, I think they create oil, actually. Yeah, that's right. The microbes actually end up creating oil. One of the ARPA-E grants there that I was reading uh, is geared specifically towards creating jet fuel. So who said it has to be gasoline or diesel that you guys produce? If you determine that the biggest deficiency in terms of supply versus demand is jet fuel, which, by the way, is very expensive, you could gear your biomass plant towards producing jet fuel. So it'll be up to you guys to decide what are the energy stocks? How much oil are we going to have? How much jet fuel will that produce as years go on? What's the demand going to look like? And I would attack the largest difference in supply versus demand, or possibly even weight that. The largest, uh, sorry, the largest difference between supply and demand times the amount of money you can make from each of those processes. Most of these are in early stages of R&D, but it's up to you guys to decide at what point is the cutoff. What's too much of an early phase for you to even consider, and what can you say, well, that might be ready in five years, and it's going to take years to license and approve this nuclear plant, so by the time it comes time to build one of these, this could be ready. Um, you could also grow algae, and there are a number of companies, even in Cambridge, that are looking at growing algae to produce what's called veg oil or biolipids. Algae grows about 20 to 30 times faster than food crops. You can have multiple harvests a year, so instead of having one giant harvest once a year, you can have continuous production of this feedstock. And algae are very greasy. When you dry algae, you can have somewhere between 20 to 50% lipid content. Lipid is fat, depending on which one you choose to use. Um, so then the lipid and carbohydrate content of the algae determines what kind of fuels you produce. However, algae are biological organisms. They can be contaminated. Other strains can move in and displace them. They can be attacked by bacteria. And it, tend, it tends to, as all things, the hardier the algae, the more resistant they are to attack, the less lipids they tend to form. So there is a trade-off between how much grease your algae can produce and how fragile it is. And there is the problem of commercial viability. Um, if you start Googling this, you'll see these giant green tanks full of algae which are closed systems, they're and they're a little harder and more expensive to produce. The reason is, if you have a big open pond, it's open to whatever could happen to blow in and contaminate it. But a big open pond certainly is a much cheaper way of producing algae. So if you can find a strain that has a good trade-off between lipid production and hardiness, then you might have a winner. Um, so with that, I'll go over some major questions that the biofuels folks should be asking themselves. What feedstock do you want to use? Do you want to use plants? Do you want to use coal? Do you want to use algae? What, and that'll help determine what products you produce. Uh, so you may consider working backwards. Think of what products you want to use in order to maximize the usefulness of this plant, and that will help narrow down what feedstocks are available to you. Uh, what temperatures do you have to work with? Are the hydrogen folks going to require 800C process heat, in which case you'll have high quality heat? Or are you going for a low temperature to open up possibilities for the core? What processes will you use? So what's the block diagram going to look like? You'll have to choose if and how to use hydrogen in biofuel production. For example, you may not need it when it comes to algae. You'll certainly need it to do efficient fish or troph synthesis. How much do you want to produce? So do you want all of the energy to go into biofuels? Maybe that's where the money is. If not, do you want to produce a certain amount of biofuels and sell the rest of the electricity? Or do you want to leave it all to hydrogen to sell to fuel cells? And what are the economics of your choices? This shouldn't be the major kill-all determining factor, but it should be in the back of your mind so you don't end up doing what my class did and making the core out of solid rhenium. So on to the design process. All about decisions. Not just making them, but why and how. So I got this figure from one of these NASA design projects. And I think it's a pretty good indication of how the design process goes overall. First is, I've taken care of this one for you. Identify the problem. I've just given you the problem. Uh, we'll be doing all this stuff in weeks one or two. Pretty much by the end of next Friday, 
you guys will be about here. Halfway through, pictorially halfway through the design cycle, but not in terms of the amount of work. Step two is identify criteria and constraints. And for you guys, that pretty much means look at the problem statement and really understand how is it constraining you and where are there places where you have a lot of freedom. Uh, these three steps are pretty much find out what's out there. Research, research, research. And then iterate. Then meet with each other and tell each other what you found. And then go back and research. And continue the cycle until you reach diminishing returns where you can research for an hour and you only find a tenth of what you're used to. At some point, and believe me, you'll know when, especially from experience, it'll be time to just move on to the next step. Select an approach. That's what you guys will be doing starting mid next week is using some official importance metrics to figure out what is the approach you want to take. And after this, you'll pretty much have one approach that you'll be doing and then you'll be able to start putting in numbers, assembling block diagrams, iterating, improving until you reach diminishing returns. And I'm not going to make you guys repeat because this is only one design problem. So steps one and two, identify key parts of the problem. This whole problem statement was in the syllabus. And I just want to point out a few things that I realize when you read them quickly, it might seem a little different from when you read them very carefully. So it was design a non-PWR or BWR that produces hydrogen and biofuels. That doesn't mean that light water is out, so supercritical water is on the table. It just means not a PWR or a BWR. It must be able to produce at least 100 megawatts electric. I didn't say we have to sell at least 100 megawatts electric. I didn't say you have to produce any electricity at all. But if you run some calculations, your plant has to be of the correct size that if you chose to make electricity, it would be possible to produce at least 100 megawatts electric. It has to produce at least one alternative fuel source. So like I said, you don't have to sell hydrogen and biofuels and other stuff. It can be just one if you choose to use one as some feedstock to the other. And the, H2, the hydrogen and biofuels processes must be somewhat demonstrated. Somewhat is up to you guys. It uh, doesn't have to be a commercial product. It probably shouldn't be just an idea in someone's head in a conference paper. Um, but it is up to you guys to decide what determines when it's demonstrated enough. Is labs, are lab scale experiments with a good promise of success good if they'll be realized in five years, in 15, in 20? And that's up to you guys to decide how quickly do you think the design you're making could be licensed and built. And in that case, what would the turnaround time have to be for whatever these processes you use to actually make success? Steps three and four, brainstorm solutions, generate ideas. Um, I would start this based on what I have told you guys uh, just in these lectures. Think of different ways to solve the problem. There are different options for the core. And in here, I would sort of categorize them. You can make a list of all of your options and then identify a, key per few, a few key parameters, like what's the size of the reactor? What are the temperatures you can use? What are some funny things about it, each technology? Um, and I'd want all four of the groups to do that so you have some easily comparable parameters moving forward. Step five is what you guys are doing right now. Lots of research. Learn what's out there. The first step is usually learn the keywords. And once you can start searching for the keywords like Fischer trope synthesis, heat storage, latent heat, sensible heat, et cetera, you'll really start to find a lot more of these papers. And what I would say is whenever you find something, share it with everyone. Share it with your team. Share it with the whole group. Because cross-pollination between these groups can sometimes lead to the best ideas. And that way, everyone's on the same field, and everyone understands what's going on in each team. So you collect your findings, compare to your friends, compare to your initial ideas, and you may end up identifying, oh, there's sort of a hole here, which means go back to step three. Do some more brainstorming, do some more research, until you reach, like I said, diminishing returns or information saturation. So you guys can come to a consensus to say, OK, I think we have enough to move forward. Let's just move on and start designing. Step six, which we'll start to get into together next week, down selection from all of your possible possibilities. Starting up here, sort of the thickness of this graph as we go down tells you how many design choices you have. 
Up here is everything, and you can probably eliminate a good number of them just by applying design criteria. Or let's say, this isn't demonstrated yet and it's not going to be for 50 years. Throw it out the window. And you reach this stage where you've narrowed down maybe half your ideas. Then in the teams, you should start choosing what's most important to you in terms of outputs, efficiency, safety, public appeal, whatever you want. And you'll be able to narrow it down in your sub-teams to very few choices, some very few possible contenders, all of which would probably make a good design. At this time, uh, which I think we'll be at near the end of next week, the group will have to meet together. And whether you decide to meet all together or just the focus area leads or pass the information up to the integrators and let them do the deciding is up to you. You'll use some sort of official design metric. Uh, for example, the HOQ, the House of Quality, which I'll get into on the next slide. So you can actually say numerically, here are the importances I ranked to different aspects of the design. And here is why we chose this one as the best possible candidate. And at that point, at the end of week four, you'll have a design path. You'll know which way to go. And you won't have to second guess yourself all the time. I didn't say never second guess yourself, because you've always got to be thinking, is there something better? But you, won't, you can shift your focus from research to design. So the house of quality is one that we've actually used in this design course a couple times. It's taken basically from the management world where you have to match the technical requirements, which are what the engineers or you guys want to happen in this design, with the customer requirements. And in this case, it's a little different from normal. Normally, you can hand out a customer survey and say, what's most important to you? But you guys are going to have to estimate what the consumer public wants. Do they want more fuel? Are they going to want more electricity? And a lot of that, you can look at supply and demand trends and see where is the biggest shortfall going to be in terms of supply versus demand? What do you think the public cares about safety? What do you think the public cares about siting? Are they all going to say, not in my backyard? Are they all going to say, no nuclear ever? Or are they going to say, go for it? It's totally the way of the future. You guys will have to choose what you think is most important. I'd recommend doing this once inside your teams so that your team leaders can meet and compare what you think importances are for the customer. Because if, after all, you're estimating importances for everyone in the country overall. Um, because this is a sort of a, a complex process, there's a good online tutorial, which is right here. And there are templates, so you don't have to build this entire thing. You can just start filling in your importances, get numbers out, and understand it. So I don't want you, to have to, you guys to have to start from scratch. Um, and if people want, if, if you try and do this house of quality thing, and it looks to be a little too difficult, we can hold a recitation with an example. This also isn't the only way to assign importances. I'm just showing you one sort of example. If you don't decide to use the house of quality, I would find a method that you can still numerically assign importances to things and come up with an answer that you can compare numerically, not just, it's clearly the best, or I feel like it's the best. Step seven, start designing. Once you've chosen your design path and you have a house of quality or some other house of something to back it up, you can start filling in parameters, constructing block diagrams, rearranging blocks. That'll come later in week four, and I'll have some more lectures on that. So don't worry about that yet. I just want to show you guys now the whole design process from start to finish. And this is a good chance to see if anything totally doesn't work, if you violated the laws of physics like you have certain amount of energy in and more energy out. Um, I know this from experience. I ran, um, I started an LED company, like an LED lighting company for the movie industry. Um, and a lot of our customers knew what they were doing. A couple did not. I was asked to produce a fixture that would consume 100 watts and put out 150. Because we'd be the first people on the market to do it. We would blow the competition away. Well, they're absolutely right, but I, I don't need to say any more. You know, I, I ended up quitting that company, too, for reasons exactly like that. Um, step eight. Step eight could be a never-ending cycle. It's up to you to choose when to end the cycle. This is the cycle of iteration, where you design your team subpart. You put it together in the whole scheme of things. Look to see where are the bottlenecks, where are the pinch points, 
What are the biggest restrictions in terms of output or input or energy flow? Go back and change things and see if a change to a parameter or a rearranging of your block diagram can improve the efficiency or the output or the total amount of production or the safety or the public appeal overall. And at some point, you guys will know after enough iteration, we're done. We could make tiny incremental changes, but it's not worth our time anymore. And that's sort of one of the biggest things in the engineering design process. When you give an engineer something and say, make me a product that does this, it's pretty common to take it to infinity, to come up with lots of extra features, to think, I know what the customer wants. Don't tell me what the customer wants. And perfect the efficiency, possibly at the sacrifice of cost or deadlines or requirements and things. And to be a really good engineering designer, you have to know when to say enough is enough. And that doesn't mean you do one design cycle and you're like, I'm done. That's it. I've, um, I'm tired. Uh, but you will get to know through experience when enough is enough. So in the last few minutes, I'd like to hear um, from the focus area leaders, how's the research process going? Or do you guys, does everybody know what sort of amount of work you guys are doing? Have the groups split up the research process and does everyone have a little bit to do, a fairly equal amount? Are you guys finding designs? Uh, for example, are you finding core designs in the core group or process heat ideas in terms of transport and storage for the process heat group? Or is anyone having trouble finding anything? Mm -hmm. terms of its viability, so great. that's kind of where we're at. Well, that's, a great, that's an excellent example. Um, how about the other groups? What are you guys doing? Uh, hydrogen, we did something similar. We, there were like six designs mentioned in the first paper you gave us, so we split them between us and we're meeting tonight to discuss um, the viability of the different designs. OK, great. Uh, how about biofuels, folks? Uh, I'm not sure how far we are at, because we haven't actually all met. Okay. Okay. Oh, great. And process heat. How's that going? That's good. Yeah. Heat exchanges are definitely the, the mathematically meatier part of the design. Um, so what I'd like to do, um, I guess everyone is free to go except the focus area leaders and the integrators. I'd like to just go over a little bit of scheduling and reporting stuff. And if anyone else has any questions that you want to come up and ask, you're welcome to do so.